Those reports of ethnic cleansing and genocide bring us images of guns, tanks, fire, and devastation, as well as anonymous children whose frightened, fleeing footsteps linger in our internal screens. But for those who live in the midst of atrocities, exile and murder are not veiled behind lenses that direct pictures to worldwide televisions. Rather, the victims of evil wear the personal faces of individuals who have families and friends and homes and gardens. People who love and are loved. People who desperately crave freedom. A lot of people think that the, uh, that the war in the Balkans was um, caused by this sort of long-term antagonism between the peoples there and <clears throat> so-called ancient hatreds, you know, the kind that could never be worked out in any reasonable way. Um, and I think, in point of fact, that's wrong. Um, peoples in the Balkans got along actually relatively well uh, compared to the rest of Europe. Professor Neymark attributes the start of the conflict between the Albanian and Serb peoples to the rise of nationalism in the beginning of the 20th century in Eastern Europe generally and the Balkans specifically. After the Ottoman Empire fell and the new Albania emerged, Albanians recognizing themselves as the vast majority of the population of the region of Kosovo saw the territory as theirs. Serbs relying on the historical mythology that Kosovo was the medieval home of their culture, viewed it as a Serbian national inheritance. In the late 80s, you know, again, communism is on its way out. Nobody believes in it anymore. And, and Milosevic comes to Kosovo and he says uh, to the Kosovar uh, uh, Serbs, you know, uh, who are complaining about discrimination, you know, we won't let them touch you. We won't let them beat you. You know, we'll make sure, you know, that these Albanians stay in their place. The war in Bosnia starts in the spring uh, of 1992 in a serious way. Ethnic cleansing comes into our, our lenses and people tend to forget about what's going on in, in Kosovo. And what's going on in Kosovo is essentially a kind of martial law. The Albanians were deprived of all of their rights. Plus of our Albanians, rather than take the continuing oppression, and that's the only way you can put it, again, martial law is not, a, not fun to live under, um, you know, start shooting at Serbs. Serbian reaction, some people will call counterinsurgency, right? But it was so severe and so, uh, out of line with the real uh, threat that the Serbs then would move into villages and start, you know, wiping them out. You know, we see massacres uh, of Kosovar Albanians in the beginning of 1999. Uh, Serbs were now um, removing uh, Kosovar Albanians in very large numbers, you know, roughly about a million people by the end, uh, had been had been ethnically cleansed uh, from uh, Kosovo. United States forces acting with our NATO allies have commenced airstrikes against Serbian military targets in the former Yugoslavia. As NATO's campaign proceeded against Slobodan Milosevic and his army with the stated mission of stopping the ethnic cleansing, the atrocities escalated. In May 1999, the United States began airlifting Kosovar Albanian refugees to McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey and housing them at Fort Dix. 
Among the refugees were three charismatic young men, actor Gentian Gresda and two acting students, Gentian's brother Plator and their friend Bekim Chela. Safe on U.S. soil, Gentian, Plator, and Bekim felt a momentary sense of peace and optimism. I want just to thank the people of the United States. They are do uh, so much for our people, you know. I appreciate that. A first cousin of Bay Kim, who had immigrated to the United States from Montenegro several years before, opened his Staten Island, New York home to Bay Kim and his friends. My sister Flucher calls me, and uh, she was working as a translator at, the, I guess, Fort Dix. It was where all the refugees came, and uh, she calls and she goes, guess, guess uh, who's here? Guess who I just saw? I'm thinking, who? Uh, she goes, Beckham, Beckham is here. I just saw Beckham, he's here in front of me. So now I had somebody to take care of, and you know, I bought clothes for them, and um, I was worried, I guess, somewhat, making sure that I could actually uh, keep supporting them. NATO's air campaign against Milosevic and his forces was successful, and the conflict in Kosovo ended on June 9, 1999. Many of the refugees who had been dispersed worldwide returned to Kosovo. Gentian, Plator, and Bey Kim, however, opted to remain in the U.S. On Independence Day, they were invited with several of their Kosovar friends to a party at the home of Americans in New Jersey, who they had first met at Stankovic's refugee camp in Macedonia. The Americans had gone there to volunteer. The drive to carve out places for themselves in their new country increased after Gentian, Plator, and Bekin contacted relatives in the Balkans who had gotten word that their immediate family members were alive and safe. Internally, however, they were worried about their loved ones and continued to feel torn between the two worlds. In August 1999, just two months after the war had ended, they yearned to travel home to Kosovo for a brief visit. They had no passport since their status was considered refugee. But in order to U.S. Senator Frank Lautenberg helped them obtain travel documents. It was the first day and we came and we saw it, but what does it mean? It's word freedom. Yeah. So we went like crazy. For the first time in my life, I was feel that, that freedom, that, you know. Gentian, Plator, and Bay King did not tell their families in Kosovo about the impending trip. True to their theatrical core, they preferred the drama of the surprise. <laughs> now that we're going back to Kosovo, I feel happy about that, and I feel happy that I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not gonna stay there. I mean, because uh, it's not. It's not really quiet, so I have. Uh, I have a chance to come back to America here. The airport in Kosovo was not yet reopened, so they landed in the neighboring country of Macedonia. They witnessed masses of returning refugees. They are getting back at last in, in a free country, Kosovo. <laughs> en route to Kosovo, they passed the refugee camp of Stankovic, where they had been interned before they had been flown to the U.S. It was at Stankovic where they had met the American volunteers whose July 4th party they would later attend. Much of the time at Stankovic had been spent with young people from an organization called SIMI, Council of Youth Movements in Israel. The SIMI volunteers had established a children's center in the midst of the refugee camp, and Genti and Plator and Bey Kim had joined their Israeli peers as counselors. The experience had distracted them from the realities through which they had just lived and their fears about the fate that had befallen their loved ones. Now retracing their wartime steps, they proceeded to the border with Kosovo, which, in the aftermath of the conflict, was governed by UN forces. They put us in a train and they bring us there and they said we must stay only, only in the truck uh, way of the train because uh, it's a... Uh, Land mines everywhere. In this place, it was been 10,000 people, but 
And in another place, 1,100 people. They're waiting to cross the border, and they're sleeping in the night, in the floor, rain, cold. No, everything terrible. The guys from Kumanovo and Skopje, they, they help us a lot. They was Albanian, so they bring a food in a tractor, and, and everybody was, was like, uh, to take more food, you know, everybody went out, yeah. give me, give me, and it was crazy, you know. And that thing reminded me like, like uh, Death Valley in a, in a Jesus Christ movie. Yeah. When, when they got a leprosa, they, they send the food down there. So, and people are running to yeah, take the food. Yeah, the food. Who, who, who gonna take first? Ah, let me, let me, me. People no. who, who give us food, they said, now he's sick, be careful, be careful, keep the mask, keep the mask, he's sick. We are not sick. No. We are all the, I, I mean, I mean, all the policemen w was wearing the mask and the gloves. Yeah. And like, like we got an epidemic or epidemic. something like that. Yeah, but we don't have nothing so, that time. So Sky for us, you are sick. And I was, sick. I was, I was, I was feeling that moment like animals. You know, that moment, this terrible moment in that moment. After six days standing in the rain and the cold, the border with Macedonia had opened and the Kosovar Albanians had crossed over in droves. Afraid of a sudden change of policy, Bekim had asked a young mother if he could hold her baby to make it appear as if he was part of her family. Then one policeman told me, give me, give me the child. And I was aggressive. No, I said, I'm going to keep the child because in that time, in that moment, that child was for me a passport to cross the border. Trying to move beyond the memories that again surrounded them, Gentian, Plator, and Bay Kim slowly made the trek back to their hometown of Jakova. They traveled on roads laden with landmines, past houses and schools that had been arbitrarily doused in oil, then torched. Along the way, they took breaks in small villages and interacted with local inhabitants. And they were confronted with additional stories of horrors their people had suffered. My emotions, they are mixed and uh, I, I can't wait, you know, I must go there and to see my parents after five months and uh, to hug him. And maybe we're gonna cry. No, but just let's go uh, to be a spontan, you know. <laughs> my sister. <laughs> This is my uncle with, with score, this. 
my uncle. That is my brother. And Beckham's brother too. <laughs> <laughs> and my little brother just told me that in that butcher that we was, he was there during the war and he got there, saw the paramilitary and he went inside and he saw that the police is coming to take paramilitary, to take meat and everything, so he got in a refrigerator, refrigerator to hide, so and then they came and just put the door and get him out and start to beat him. Yeah. <laughs> and after that, release him. Thank God, he's alive now. <laughs> yeah. When we was in Stankovac, came the new people in, in a camp and so I had one man just holding his, kid, his little child and he looked like uh, the same face like my brother and I gave to him a chocolate sneakers <laughs> and he smiled like my, my this brother so that was the reason that I started to cry that night all the time I worried about him so and that was the reason today that I cry in Rechak too because that killing kids 12 years old he, he couldn't be my brother too Kam qenë nuk qenë, kam qenë të vlavi, dy dit para se u boj lufta, që ashtu që kam metë tje, dhe shpe që jam pon shumë jam mërzit, së kam dasha së me hangër ësë me pisë, ato ishë në pëmite mi nuk e kërkon. Marë vesh për bekimin, kur kam pasë datë lindjen, me një maje kam pasë, bekimi më ka thyrë, më ka thanë du me shku për Izrael, i kam thanë bekim, shko në Amerikë se tje i ketë tot, e në ashtë të kalon ma mirë, edhe thanon, që shtu është ti për baj, të shkoj. Tu kemi marrë vesh për bekimin, krej kemi dridhë, kemi kajt. Bujin, Blendi and their father had been forced out of their apartment. They had found refuge in a shelter with extended family members. A powerful moment that captivated Bekim's attention came when he visited a coffee bar named Take Five where he had worked for two years after his high school graduation, saving money to attend university in Pristina. In that, in that second floor, we used to, we used to practice with, uh, with, with my boss, because he was director. He finished in Romania. And he, he, he practiced me and the other guy to go to study in Pristina. So we practiced maybe one month and a half to go to Pristina and so that was a place that, uh, that we practice in. In comparison to the escape of Bey Kim's family from their apartment building, the immediate family of Gentian and Plator had been imprisoned for seven weeks inside the stately house they shared with the family of Kadrush. The uncle of Gentian and Plator, Kadrush is a prominent architect who had built the house inhabited by the two Gresda families. The house is situated on a steep hill in Jakova. A Serbian police station had been posted at the road's summit. Serb soldiers had patrolled the street constantly, looking for signs of life and sometimes inflicting inconceivable torture that terrorized the entire neighborhood. They came to my gates here, tried to open the first part of the gate, then the next, but luckily it was, it was closed. So they couldn't open it and they go down, went down, and came to this house. But they hit the door strongly, and he opened the door. They massacred him, and they cut off his throat. We 
he had his screen, which was there with us. And the next day, my wife and uh, Gentian's mother and another old woman from the next door decided to go inside the house. The me gratë pushive i mi shku e kemi qëtër, i mi hinë shpe, kemi qëtër, kër i mi hyk në e kemi pa njëri unë e mytën. Një farë të rështimi. Ma se e nisa, me gjenë në agjes, që lumë. Në ashtë ta në vynë, kër do herë, kur s'ki në ushqem, në vynë, në apu në këshem. Kër fillonë një të punën në këherë, punën në ushtarë se vëzëm vëtëm unë gjithë shënë, i lekshëm dhe i glatë ka dole dhe shëshëm bëra pa shpisë. Me 24, kër Amerika, kër bombardoj Sërbin, kër fillonë bombardimet, unë e... Me një herë më ka api friga, dhe mos tuta për këto edhe friga për djemët, që kisha në Prishtin. Kër mora veshtë në Prishtin, vishtë trimi veti kanë arestu, kanë marë pengë, mu me një herë shkoj mërënja që edhe djemët e mi më kanë marë. The emotional devastation had been mirrored by a concrete reality of destruction. This is my uncle's offices. He is the architect, and we're going to go inside just to look. I come in here, I work with my uncle, and the computer, and our computer <laughs> is broke. Example from German, from England, from French, they bring, they send with mail. Example, uh, books for, for just for ar architecture. You understand? See, Who's been here? No. Look now. Nothing. Besides, it's not hard, man. But I, I still am poor. Nearly a quarter cent, man. Very sad. Just that old age. Just that many moment. Just a, just a co. Man, just can't. Prap. No more medicine. No more medicine. Spirger nearing the top moment. The corner is in Spirger. Prashus e osni humbi jens the corner is the mad. The cost humbi material. Osni the humbi spirit noar. Os humbi sumi de na vendi humbi e krim e krimi diskafit ne priu caktume kohor. I was been here three five times, you know, just to look in yet, you know, because I must to come here to look my mask, you know, because I am Muslim. But uh, when first time when come the tu uh, Turkish Empire, when first time they come here, Ottoman, they built this this uh, mosque, and they started to the new city, you know, Jakova. They start to call Jakova new city because my city is 500 years old. The Serbian people there destroyed my life. <laughs> They, they broke my heart. How can I, how can I forgive this? They traveled next to the capital city of Pristina, where they had shared an apartment, but stopped along the way at two alarming sites that had not been part of any pre-war Kosovo they had known. At the first, a United Nations war crimes team was uncovering mass graves of massacred Albanians. We have just been overwhelmed with the amount of crime scenes and mass graves that we're finding. This is. Uh, this is one that we believe is a mass grave. We have no idea how many bodies we will find here. Um, but this is, of course, is the preliminary stages of trying to discover that fact. It's a huge task. It's something that we've never seen before and hope never to see again. With emotions soaring in fragmented directions, the second stop before they reached Pristina 
was a day camp set up by a German Adventist non-governmental organization, which provided activities for children who had lost one or both parents. The arrival of Pied Piper Bakim and his pal Plator brought the kids amplified joy that day. Jacob this morning, I, I, I feel very bad, little bad because my heart is in Jacob. When we went in the swimming pool playing with the kids, it was something, something special for me. Because I, I always dreamed to have a like, big kindergarten to play all the time with the kids because I love them so much. For the first time I come here in Pristina after four months, you know, my heart is stopping to bumping, bump, 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 you know. Because in this city, I was finishing the school, university, acting school, and after that, here I started my career. And here, in this city, I was have a tragedy, my tragedy. Gentian's nerves were particularly charged as he relived his most awful personal memory, the murder of his girlfriend, Adriana a recent graduate of the Academy of Fine Arts who had been having a drink with friends and a professor in the popular student bar called Magic. That day, she, she told me, Did you come tonight with me, you know, in this bar, Magic? Uh, and I told her, no, I can't come tonight because I must to learn, you know? The next day, it was being morning. And uh, my brother, Platter, came in, in the apartment in the morning with newspaper. Wake up. Get in, wake up. Uh, Ajahn is, is killed. And after that, next day, started NATO bombing. And I didn't know nothing, no information. First we heard them talking in Serbian, and then they shot it on us with the first, because there were dumb, dumb Kalashnikov bullets. And she fell, and me, I jumped under the table. My professor did the same. I think they emptied on us 70 or 80 bullets. So first, what I did is that I started to yell, Adriana. I, I cast her, I gave her a breath, but mouth by mouth. I was pushing with my right hand, even if I couldn't move it, and my left hand, her heart, and her heart started to beat because she was still alive. She opened her eyes. Uh, she couldn't expel the word, her mama, in, and then she, the, blood, the last blood came out from her mouth, and then she died. Adriana, she was a person who wanted to live free, when the Kosovo was occupied, me also, we wanted to live, as, to live as free persons, and we risked our lives just by going out and drinking coffee. So she gave her life in that way, because she wanted to live free. Italian surgery. Leonora had overcome paralysis and two surgeries to remove bullets. She was continuing to take acting classes at the Academy of Fine Arts, the university that had been the central focus of the intellectual and social lives of Gentian, Plator, Bekim, and their friends. <laughs> they also returned to the apartment that had been home away from home to them before the day they were amongst the ethnically cleansed population. 
I was looking out the window when I saw Serbian soldiers. Then they broke down our courtyard door, entered our house and forced us out. They threw me against the wall in the street, put a gun to my head, ordering me to give them money. They took my wallet and let me go. They forced all of us and hundreds of Albanians in the street to walk to the train station. When we got there, thousands more were waiting. We didn't know where we were going, but after six hours, they packed us in the train and sent us to the border of Macedonia. As the Pristina memories of trauma intermingled with a sentimental nostalgia for happy moments that had been spent with good friends in pursuit of hopeful futures, the post-war tears evaporated into smiles. <laughs> and the smiles mixed again with tears as they kissed their families goodbye, not knowing when they would next embrace. Before returning to their new home in the United States, Gentian, Plator, and Bekim had the opportunity to go to Israel to visit the Israeli co-counselors whom they had befriended at Stankovitz, as well as their friend from Jakova named Fatim, who had shared their tent in Macedonia. Fatim was living with approximately 100 other Kosovar Albanian refugees on Kibbutz Ma'agan Mikhail. Meeting with his good friends from Jakova, he recalled the Israeli-bound path that he had taken with his older brother, Liren, a medical student who had worked with staff at a makeshift Israeli hospital built at Stankovitz. Bekim and the uh, Plator and the uh, Wengenti and he staying in the tent because uh, they can't go in the Israel. I can, I can go with just me and my brother. And the Bekim is waiting for the visa, and I don't know, from the Israel. And I was going the, in the Israel. And I come in the Israel, the Bekim asked me, why is the Israel? I said, it is the best, believe me, you will come, it's everything, it's okay. He said, I will come in the Israel. But uh, after one week, I spoke with him and he said, I am now in the U.S. In the U.S.? Oh, oh I don't believe, you know, you are, you are in the Stankos, but you are joking with me. No, no, I am in the U.S. Oh, it's, it's the paradise there. Oh, in the U.S.? Oh, it's the great, it's the great. And now, I don't know, I don't know nothing. In the first day, if I see the friends after three months, everything is, I think, is the dream. But when I see the Beckham is coming like the gentleman, I see it's coming. Oh, it's the surprise for me, it's the, it's the big day for me today. In our, uh, in our uh, movement, we have also Arab Muslims. And now, they look at them maybe a little bit in the other point of view, like human beings, not like enemy, not like uh, some, someone that has another religion. And because of that, I think that uh, it was very, very, very important. The, when the Jews suffered in the Second World War, in the Holocaust, we told all over the world, how could you stand and see our suffer and no, do nothing? And the Jewish people has to understand that they have to do something with it all over the world because this is the most important, important moral value. Yes, to, 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 to tell ourselves that the suffer of everyone all over the world is our problem. Because of that, we decided to go to Stankovic and to do it. My brand. One day, I, uh, we were in the tent, we were like uh, working in the middle of all the activities, and Gentian uh, went in in a, in a great rush, but very, very excited for something, I didn't know what. He looked very, very nervous, and he carried in, in his hand a little girl, uh, maybe 14, 15 years old. And he uh, explained me in, uh, his, uh, his, his, in his English, um, that that girl was uh, look like very very much his, his one of his friend that uh, got killed in uh, in Kosovo, and she, he said she looked exactly like her, and he wanted to to he started to walk all over the tent and to, to give her something to give her gift. I just for the days I met him, I just knew he was uh, like 
a very uh, funny guy, laugh all the time, trying to, to make the kids smile, work very hard for that. And suddenly I saw a different man. And uh, I, I think that that makes me to understand better the, the, the whole thing that happened to the Albanian people. And I know, and even Gentian told me that none of the children uh, will forget the smile they got from us when they needed it. And I hope they won't forget it. And I hope, I know that I won't forget the smiles I got from them, the hugs I got from them. I think even in my wedding, I'll never get so many kisses and hugs like I got there in one day. So I hope it's going to be so good. And I know for me, um, now when I think about it, maybe if I wasn't going through this uh, experience, if I would come to uh, Yugoslavia and they told me they're Muslims, then I said, OK, maybe I shouldn't go near them. But now I said, like, there's no, there's nothing into it. And like, it's so good. It's so people to people. And you can work it out. It can happen. Modern aviation brought Genti and Plator and Big Kim back from Israel and from the still unstable experiment in hope that characterized Kosovo to the chaotic and opportunity-laden streets of New York. Here, in this bustling American city of talent, creativity, skills, brains, and money, they would be destined to find ways of integrating their past experiences with their colorful dreams for the future. Finding their way through this new life maze would require experiences defined by relationships, work, leisure activities, and an understanding of the cultural and political context. It was very hard at the beginning because I didn't speak very well English and, and I couldn't get a job in my profession because my English was so poor. Bekim's cousins Astrid and Flutra helped them land their first jobs. Uh, me and my sister found them an apartment and um, they moved out and I was home alone again. Uh, they moved out, we sort of put some, some furniture and uh, I guess well, we paid for their first month, I guess, rent or whatnot. I mean, they were there. Uh, I, a week after, I found them a job. I think I found uh, Gentiano a job first and then it was back in the Plateau. I worked for a cleaning company. Their apartment was near the Staten Island Ferry on which they commuted each evening to New York City offices that they cleaned for the maintenance firm that employed them. Gentian, who had worked as a professional actor, and Plator and Bay Kim, who had been serious acting students, did not like their Manhattan jobs. But as new immigrants, speaking the actual and metaphorical language of their native culture, they initially had few other opportunities. At least they earned a minimal income and received health care coverage. I work different jobs, and in the same time, I have to support my family back home. So I've been sending a little bit of money for my brother and my sister back home because they continue studying in university in Kosovo and Albania. And in the same time, I had, I had to, to start and to get involved in American society. And it's just, it's like you are born again for a second time. I moved from New York in New Jersey, and I live in Montclair, where I find a job as a, in one coffee shop, and I start getting involved more to be so, socialized with people and starting having network and connecting with them. And in one, our customers who come in our store, he, he helped me to get an audition in, in The Sopranos, in the show. I didn't get the part, but at least I tried. Bekim and Plateau continued working in their office maintenance jobs for a longer time, even becoming union members for a while. We, we was getting paid. It, it wasn't so bad, but uh, I knew that I'm going to need a change because uh, that wasn't a job for me. I got like uh, extra part to play in Zoolanda and in uh, Danny DeVito. He was he was a director, Death of the Smoochie, I think. And, uh, in Zulana, I went from 9 o'clock in the morning until 2 o'clock in the morning, next morning, and then I went to do my job, maintenance, which, which, it, took, uh, which it was until uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, then right away in a shooting. So it was two days on a roll, and uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it. So then I decided just uh, to do that thing when, you know, when I have more time and when, when I'm going to be like more financial. 
better. As for my brother, Plator, he's, he's not getting very, you know, socialized with people here. He didn't like his job in maintenance. He used to work with, before in computers with my uncle. And uh, he, he, he got some money, he bought a computer. While Plator immersed himself in the computer, De Kim and Gentian pursued continuing educational opportunities. I went in uh, Staten Island, it was a high school, and uh, I went there in order to take the GD in, in the fast way. It was like with seven levels, and like about in a month, I already moved in the fifth level. A university graduate, Gentian had salvaged his transcript in spite of the ethnic cleansing ordeal. He submitted it for evaluation to the World Education Services, which found that he had graduated from a regionally accredited university and calculated his grade point to average as 3.64 out of 4.0. On a social level, all three maintained friendships with some of the Americans who had volunteered right. at Stankovic. We were surprised when you guys came there and bring in, I mean, a lot of... All that stuff? Yeah, for Did kids, you know, because we tried to work hard with Simi. My father was a survivor of Vashitz, whose wife and child were murdered in the camps by Mengele. And my mother was a passenger on something called a Kostner transport because her, uh, her brother and my father had smuggled her out of the Warsaw Ghetto from Poland. So that when you see refugees on television, it's not just a question of not doing anything. It's a question of, yes, you have to pick yourself up and do something. Gentian, Plateau, and Beijing partook in some American traditions, particularly enjoying Thanksgiving celebrations with American families. One unique American experience Bei Kim and Gentian shared bridged their two worlds. They traveled to a U.S. military base in Louisiana, where for one month they worked with forces preparing for duty in Kosovo. Gentian became somewhat adventuresome and took to the American road a bit, seeking to learn more about his new country. I went through some, some countries in the United States, in Louisiana, in North Carolina. I passed North Carolina. I went to Philadelphia to see historical things about, about this country. And uh, I came now in west of, of the United States, in California, and I had a great time. And I, I had so beautiful places of this part of the country. And really, I'm amazed about about this uh, beauty of, of, you know, and of a lot of opportunities you ha have a chance to, to get in this country. A tender, and some tea set, sake set, coffee set. Yeah, man, you look, look at me. I look marvelous. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. <laughs> so what do you do with the sake coming out here for Africa? Over a two and a half year period, Gentian, Plateau, and Bay Kim were able to overcome many of the initial hurdles accompanying the status of new immigrants. With a still emerging sense of stability, they decided to return to Kosovo to visit their families and friends for six weeks over the New Year's holiday, 2001 to 2002. In the heart of the Kosovo winter, temperatures reached well below zero degrees Fahrenheit. Electricity was rationed four hours at a time interrupted by two-hour periods with no power. When there was no electricity, there was virtually no heat. I don't see my father is going to have uh, an opportunity anymore. Yeah. But 
And I see him sad. I see him sad. Yeah. Because he loved his job, his profession. But now he's not doing exactly the same thing. Omar. His met had been a banker before the war. But there was still essentially no banking system in Kosovo. In order to earn money, he worked as a bookkeeper and accountant for a business owned by his four brothers-in-law called Ferrell, which manufactures metal display shells. Like other goods-related businesses, the growth possibilities for Ferrell are stymied because of the failure of the international world to define a political status for Kosovo. Yet the family business optimistically forges ahead. In December 2001, it displayed its products at a commercial expo in Jakova that was the brainstorm of the businessman Mark Tsulai. Uh, in one way, the Kosovo is uh, formally part of Yugoslavia. R uh, reality, it is uh, under uh, government of United Nations. So uh, this uh, uh, makes some, uh, some uh, uh, bureaucratic and administrative problems to export our goods. Independence, you know, gives these societies a sense of purpose and a sense of cohesion and an ability to control their own destiny, which is, which is a very powerful motive for economic development, uh, for cultural development, for political self-esteem. The priority is the economic economy, privatism gradual, the investment dhe kriimi vendeve të reja të punës. Naturisht, këtu do të punojmë me qeverime, organizata jo qeveritare tjera, pra këto e në objektivat kryesore. Tërsa objektivi nacional, pavarësia, është një qashtë që do të punojmë edhe me ate, por do të fokusohemi shumë në problemet ekonomike dhe në zhvillimin ekonomike. In contrast to firms thirsty for the export market, Architectural services rebuilding the country were in great demand. The business of Kadrush, the uncle of Gentin and Plator, had begun again to flourish. Among the exciting projects he was asked to design was the rebuilding of a mosque in a hilltop town called Shkiponia, on the outskirts of Jakoba. The project was spearheaded by the American-Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, working with the Islamic Faculty of Kosovo and the Roman Catholic Church of Kosovo. We found an architect, very special architect, um, Kadrush, um, that we got uh, um, uh, his name from Albania. I worked in, uh, in, uh, in Bosnia, in Sarajevo during the war. And uh, I saw that during the war, slowly, slowly, um, the Islamic uh, extremist group entered to uh, Sarajevo and they help the people in condition that they will, uh, they will be, if you want, extremist religious, if you want, religion. And um, uh, we came uh, to idea in, uh, in, in the States that um, if we will succeed here to build a mosque with the Islamic community of Kosovo, perhaps it will show that there is another way to live together. While the Gresda family's living conditions were far below the standard to which they had been accustomed before the war, at least the father and uncle of Gentian and Plateau were earning some income. Bekim's parents were more destitute. Only a few months before Bekim's return visit, his father, once a contractor, had found a job as a foreman. 
His new employer was a non-governmental organization, which was constructing a religious Muslim school called a madrasa. During Bey Kim's visit, the U.S. government, under the authority of the Patriot Act, signed into law after the terrorism of September 11th, blocked the assets of the Global Relief Foundation offices in the U.S. in aid of an investigation. The government alleged that the organization had provided financial support to terrorist groups. A week later, Bey Kim's father was again jobless. <laughs> Blendy, now a growing teenager, is in secondary school. <laughs> Bekim's brother Borim moved to Pristina, where he is attending university, studying journalism. When now we are di divided from my brother Bekim, he is in USA, and I here, I miss him too much. And I would like, I would like to go in USA to be with him. I was, I was in Take Five, and I'm glad that they are rebuilding that bar that I used to work. I think that it's going to be a chapter in my life. It's going to be one chapter in my life. But I think that I need to move on. Even, uh, I mean, to start to start my new life in America, and move on and do something good, and then come back one day and visit and tell them about about my experience in America. I see differences in Kosovo. I see freedom because that we wanted for for ten years. But I choose to live again in the United States because I need to learn more about life, about system about law, forget about religion, forget about nationality, but it's people to people. And I find, I find out that in the United States, and this is my old point, I, I, I just want to live right now in the United States. New York is so it's big and it's, uh, the, the life in New York is, 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 is so dynamic, you know, and, uh, and it's so scary for me because I'm, I'm in a small country. I, I born in a small country. Actually, example my brother. I'm not like my brother, you know. My brother is, uh, he go in the in the in the uh, like uh, in the life. He go in uh, in 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 the American life. He's in the American life. I I'm I am right now so confused. Millions of people around the world, for whom daily survival is a struggle dream of the America they see in movies and television shows. Yet the few who find a legal way to follow the red, white, and blue road over the border usually notice one leg eternally left in their country of origin, where loved ones still live and where language and culture are as comfortable as worn shoes. As they straddle the two countries, they often discover that the preconceived images of American life do not match the realities of existence as new immigrants. Not everyone stays. In fact, the majority of Kosovo refugees airlifted to Fort Dix during the war returned home. The land that pulled them back is filled with potential. The current governing forces of the United Nations mission in Kosovo protect freedom for all citizens. In a trial that began in February 2002 and is expected to last up to two years, Slobodan Milosevic became the first head of state to be tried for war crimes at The Hague 
accused of using forced relocations and genocide to create an ethnically pure Serbia in Kosovo and other parts of the Balkans. While the questions of independent statehood and economic development in Kosovo remain outstanding, a sense of hope fills the atmosphere. Its spirit tugs strongly at Plateau. When I realized I saw that uh, the economy is so down, so I didn't find a job or to stay or something, so I turned back. But after spending six weeks away, Plateau lost his job with the office maintenance company. He found new work as a busboy at a diner in Staten Island. Probably he may go home or may stay here. He's not sure exactly, he's a little bit confused because it's different life. It's different language, different mentality, different society. And some people, they are not strong enough to be able to, to pursue, and to be able to pursue new ca career and new life in different country. Soon after returning, Bekim spoke with an Albanian-American friend named Dreni, with whom he had become acquainted at the American military base in Louisiana. Dreni helped him get a job in an American-style Take Five type of cafe. A lot of famous people showed up there, so uh, you never know what's going to happen. You know, it, uh, maybe I'm going to get in contact with them and let them know that I'm an, I'm an actor from Kosovo. I'm looking just for a small part, you know, just for a small and uh, show my skills. Just as Bay Kim had worked in Take 5, saving money for university in Pristina, he now works at Lot 61, saving money for college in the U.S. I will try to get financial aid or just try through my friends or through somebody just to make money and to finish college. Because it is important. I don't want to be all my life a uh, bartender or something like that. That's not me. We start coming up with ideas, especially in our profession, in acting, in film, and try to, to tell people about us, who we are, and where we came from. The documentary ends, and life as new Americans, without video cameras over their shoulders, begins now. Four years since the arrival of Genti and Plateau and Bay Kim in the U.S. Once anonymous faces on TV news about Kosovar Albanians in refugee camps, today they are immigrants whose faces blend into America's frenzied mix of ethnicities. Their stories and the stories of their people, however, will never fade like the print of a newspaper. <laughs>